What I thought, rather than reading anything out, is, um, as it's a special, uh, different lecture, is really just to talk to you about a life in visual media. Uh, I should preface it um, by saying that, as my wife is constantly reminding me, I'm not a filmmaker or a visual anthropologist or anything of that kind. This is just a hobby. Uh, I'm better known for my historical work and my political philosophy and other and demography and other fields. Uh, I, I just enjoy tinkering, particularly with gadgetry, computers and multimedia and films. So it's always been a hobby and I've, during that hobby I've had the great pleasure of teaching um, some of you and uh, encouraging what I think is a terribly important field. I was never trained in it, but I do think it is, particularly now, of course, the dominant media is visual. The structure of the talk, um, it will be in two parts, and I'll give you just a breath, breath in between, I hope. Um, the first one is how we got up to the present, and <clears throat> that's two-thirds of it, and then the, the last third is just um, sharing with you something I'm doing at the moment is very, very recent, and is, I think, possibly a resolution to a life's puzzle in visual media. The puzzle really is how academics and thinkers can use film productively while retaining the strengths of text alongside film, which has always been my puzzle. So let me start with how we got here, which is really an illustration of Moore's Law. You all probably know Moore's Law, but the power of computers doubles every... Well, when Moore invented it, it was every 18 months. Then it became 15 months. It's now nine months. So the cost of computers halves every nine months, and, or doubles, if which way you like it. Um, so it starts very slowly. It's exponential. And what I'm going to show you is the exponential development of film in my own lifetime. So I thought I'd start way back in the 1950s-60s by paying a tribute to a man I think is the greatest ethnographic filmmaker in history, my former supervisor, Christoph von Führer Hammendorf. Uh, Christoph was my PhD supervisor, as I mentioned, I was his last, more or less his last student in the late 60s. And when I went through his influence to Nepal, I didn't really know that he was a filmmaker. It was only really later. In fact, he didn't even t tell me to take a moving camera. I think we discussed it and he said, they're too expensive, but do take a tape recorder and a good camera. So, Christoph uh, had been filming, this is, I think, his first film. It says, On the Boat, 1939. <laughs> he was then... Uh, as a political prisoner of the British uh, told not to leave Hyderabad so he became the tribal advisor to the Nizam of Hyderabad and filmed in Hyderabad for another seven years he then became the first Western Europe anthropologist to go to Nepal in 1953 and he filmed throughout Nepal and then in Assam, Arunachal Pradesh and then later in the Philippines, Mexico and elsewhere and I inherited all his films it was given to me and I put up a lot on YouTube and on my website so if you're interested just type Heimendorf film and you'll be able to see it. This, this is the camera, not his first camera David tells me, but one he probably used in Nepal in the 60s. He went on a number of expeditions and um, took film like this. Very heavy, short duration, no sound. The results of that can be seen in the first little bit of film, which I'll show you here, um, which is taken from a BBC film called Land of the Gurkhas. What I perhaps will anticipate by telling you is just watch the dancing of the Gurung people who are of central Nepal, and I'll be talking about them if any of you mention Nepal, around Pokhara, the Annapurna Mountains. The Gurungs lived there, and he visited them probably about ten years before I went, and he recommended I went and studied them. So this visit had a big influence on me. But he made this film with a camera like that 
handed it over to the BBC and they made a film called Land of the Gurkhas and I'll just show you a couple of minutes. On feast days, all the people congregate in the villages. During one month of the year, a strange ritual takes place when parties of girls work themselves up into a religious trance. They are then believed to be possessed by a spirit, a goddess. In this way, the supernatural becomes part of everyday life, and the gods and goddesses of Nepal make their presence felt in the remotest villages to the simplest of people. So you'll have noticed the music doesn't go with the dance. It's um, probably pop music which the BBC had in some cupboard and they shut it on. It completely makes nonsense of the dance. Um, it, it illustrates something about that period, which is that the filmmakers, anthropological filmmakers, in order to get the money to do the filmmaking, had to get into contracts with film companies and lost control. One of the things that I think is wonderful about what's happened in the last half century is that anthropologists and others who are interested in this now can do the whole thing. They can devise the, the, um, what they want to film, they can film it, they can edit it, and now, of course, they can broadcast it. So, uh, but there was a period, particularly as David knows in the 60s, 70s, when um, unionization meant that anthropologists lost control of their film. But it is a rather beautiful film and very unusual. It's the earliest film I know of that particular dance called the Gato, which is still dancing. Um, so when I went out in 68, um, I didn't take a film camera, but then I did, in Kathmandu in 1969, I found that they were selling cheap uh, um, Konica, this is, um, film cameras, it's 8mm, and so I bought one, and it took little film, three minutes, no sound, no zoom, no low light, but I was able to take, just in the last two or three months, film which for some years I couldn't think of what to do with. I tried to make it up into films to show to people, but um, as you probably know, you had to um, cut it up, splice it, use bits of sellotape and glue and all that stuff. And when you got the films that I found produced them, who was going to watch them? My family reluctantly watched a bit, and that, and that was about it. And so about 40 years they've been unused. But now, as I look at them, I'm amazed how interesting and how important they are, that each image it's quite high quality and you can still frame them and look at them. And they show a world which I have already forgotten largely. So I want to um, show you just a tiny bit from that early film and show you the quality, although it's been reduced a lot. Uh, so this is a little bit of a rice protection ritual which I've never seen again. And I don't know that they still do it.
Uh, that was the film in 1969. Then um, my wife Sarah and I went back in 1986 with the same small camera and for a couple of years we filmed with that. Then in 1988, it must have happened before, um, the Japanese in particular invented video. It must have been early 80s, but it didn't get to me until 88. So in 1988, I went out with a video camera. And that completely transformed filming for me. Firstly, obviously, you've got the sound with the picture. Secondly, you've got the low light. Thirdly, you've got zoom. Fourthly, you've got with this camera, I, I would never film more than 12 seconds because of the, the cost of the film and um, the fact you only had three minutes. But with video, you could let it roll uh, up to a point, although batteries were difficult to take to the village. So, in 1988, I started filming seriously in the village of Tak, north of Pokhara, uh, which I first visited in 1968. And here you see the same dance filmed actually in 1990. Um, with the accompanying sounds, and of course it's in colour, and I'm just tinkering. This was really my first proper film of a ritual, and I'm playing with the fact that you can use zoom to come up very close. Although, as you notice, Heimendorf used zoom too. sister, I'd been adopted into the family, and centre it on her and her family. And this would give it um, a unity, unity of character and development. And particularly to focus on the relationship between a mother and her daughter, because I got close to a little girl who was 18 months when we first met there in 86, and by now it was two or three. And to watch this interaction and to film their lives um, in detail. And so I'll just show you, the, actually this quality doesn't look much better, but uh, if it was properly um, compressed it probably would. Oh, 
Mm. <laughs> you should get down on the level of the people you're filming, get very close and enter into conversations with them, which I tended to do. And though you may not have seen it in that, the subject, that is Bill Meyer, was an absolutely superb subject for filming. She wasn't embarrassed and she knew where to be in the camera and so on. So we established a, a really interesting film relationship. What I discovered, I, I tried out my films on my students and I discovered that thematic intellectual films the life of the buffalo or um, ritual of the gurungs, that kind of thing, didn't work. But when I showed them an actual process, something happening, like going up to the wood and cutting down some trees and then coming back to the village, just an event like that, they really liked it. Um, I also, uh, a little later, um, took the film back to the village um, we were told that it was important to get the reactions. There was no electricity, um, but we took up a generator and a, a television screen in uh, about, 90, about this time, 92, 93, and set it up in the village and got the whole village who wanted, most of them came and watched it, and then I got their comments on it. And they surprised me somewhat in two ways. One was going on and explaining what was happening and so on, didn't seem to be worried at all by it. Um, the only comment, negative comment she said was that you showed my bare cracked feet, which I showed from behind when she was walking on the path, and she didn't particularly like that. The villagers surprised me because I thought they would love these rituals that I've shown you, the dancing and so on. They weren't really very interested in that. What they really loved was the very close-up photographs of someone taking seed off a rice plant, or unpicking a bit of thread, or uh, a child just playing with a very small object. And I realised, of course, that what you can see with a normal eye um, isn't particularly outstanding. What is amazing about the camera is the zoom and the focusing, and therefore they could see things which they'd never noticed or seen by the zoom. And um, this is what they really liked. So from then on, I would use quite a lot of zoom in and out. Um, alongside the discovery of the theme at that time, the other thing which um, has really, <coughs> will feed into what I talk about later, was that, of course, by then I was teaching visual anthropology at in Cambridge, and I knew of some of the distinguished work of my predecessors, particularly Melissa Llewellyn Davis and others, talking to people about their lives, um, Diary of a Sign Woman and so on. And <coughs> that partly, and also the fact that I was doing a lot of interviews of academics and others by this time, and even filming my own family and interviewing some of them, made me think I ought to really do an in-depth set of interviews. I'd done interviews of Bill Meyer and her husband in 1990, in 1992, fortunately, now I had this new camera, and I had enough battery, I said, can I film your uh, views on life, or, uh, I wouldn't put it like that, but let's, let's talk about your life. And by this time I'd been six times, um, spent six months in her, the yard with her, I was her brother, um, we were helping educate the children, and we were an intertwined family. So. We sat on her veranda, often when she's doing things, as I'll show you, and um, she just talked about everything. It's a very open, egalitarian, male-female relationship in this society anyway, so there was nothing I couldn't talk about. We talked about menstruation, we talked about childbirth, we talked about fear, pain, and the happy things of life. 
and I did 11 interviews, each of about 20 minutes. And, as I'll explain in the second part of this, for years I wanted to do something with this, to try and use it, but there's been no way to do so, and I just, I think, found a way to do it. But anyway, these interviews uh, are very important, and then I interviewed her husband, and sub subsequently her daughter Prem Kumari, and her son, and other relatives. The real problem um, throughout this period in the 90s, for me, was how do you, what, what do you do with this film? I mean, Heinendorf in his autobiography hardly mentions he's a filmmaker. The reason was he had no use for it. He, I remember going to a Cambridge Anthropology Society film evening, and he showed his Sherpa film. That was the real, first time I really realized he was a filmmaker. And other, apart from these particular occasions, it was very difficult to know how you use film. Any of you who have given courses, visual anthropology courses even, but particularly any other kind of course, knows that you can't use film in lectures on the whole. You can give a, show a film and then um, discuss it in a lecture, but if you show more than two or three minutes in a normal lecture, students get very restless. They've come for ideas. They've not come for padding as it seems. You can have special occasions like um, film viewings, but it's very difficult to use. And of course, as a result, many filmmakers, uh, anthropological filmmakers, the only occasion they could really get their film, films seen, as David and others know, is to go to film festivals and show them to other filmmakers, usually, rather than anthropologists. So it was difficult to know. I did devise one um, innovation which I thought would be repeated, but it hasn't often, and I don't know whether Marcus came to it at all, but for about five years I um, created what I call virtual reality days. That is, I would take over the department seminar room and sometimes at my home, and I'd invite whichever group I was teaching, the um, third or the first year or the third year, and we would spend a Saturday. I would get King's College to make Nepali style food, I would try and get some of the local Millet whiskey, and on one occasion I got a very powerful shaman to come and bless us all. And we would watch films for six hours, hopefully getting a little drunk and eating, and we would have incense burning. And the idea was to try and, I didn't have the money or energy to take my students to Nepal, but for a day we would be in Nepal through film. And a number of people said it was a highlight of their course, but it was quite a lot of work to organise it. But apart from that, how can you use film? And this has always been the problem. The problem, as I mentioned in the overview, is the problem of filming, the problem of editing, the problem of displaying. And the last is as important as the first two. A new development for me uh, and transformation <coughs> occurred around 1999. Uh, I started to make a, a film or series of films with a Channel 4, a British film company, to celebrate the millennium. Uh, it was a six-part series on the history of the world, and they came with me to Nepal um, to film in the village, and, and made some very nice films there. I learned a lot about filmmaking from watching them and working with them over a year or so. Um, and about the same time, i.e. 1998, um, my neighbour next door rushed into my house, he's uh, interested in technology, he said, Alan, have you heard about these new cameras, digital cameras? They have a little thing at the back, um, which is called a fire run, an IE, whatever it is, 1334 or whatever, port. In other words, a digital out. You can use these cameras and take your, what is now digital film, and put it into a computer. He said, I got hold of the first one in the UK, would you like to buy it? So this is the first one I'm told in the UK. And this, this is a quantum leap. It's about the same degree of change as video, the invention of video. Because basically it may, means it opens out all these other possibilities. About at the same time, the World Wide Web was, um, broadband was developing. Apple Mac was making edit programs. Two or three later, years later, you got these amazing hard disks on which you could store and edit your films. I mean, again, to show the technology, when I first bought 
a 500 gigabyte external hard disk. It costs 750 pounds. This one, which I bought the other day, is two of those. It's one terabyte, and it costs 45 pounds. Um, all these things coming together meant that around 2000 or so, you can make film of far higher quality and you can begin to move away from the kind of editing I was doing before and um, begin to think of some new way of making the film available. Now, I want to show you the contrast between the qualities of the early film and the later. This, um, there's some glitch in my editing here, 1992, ignore. This is the Krishna Salitra in 1990, i.e. with my first camera. We just come back from Nepal, my wife and I, um, for the memorial service for my brother-in-law. And um, I'll have to mute this a bit because this is just a tiny bit of the same ritual. It's not the same part of the dance. But you'll see what uh, more uh, recent, not high quality, this is an HD or three chip on you, just an ordinary um, tourist video camera can do now. <laughs>
going up exponentially, but the world around it is changing exponentially. And I thought I would just show you this very quickly, because the world I went out to in 1969, Cochra had no road to it, arrived in an aeroplane, and this is the city of Pokhara in 1969, and then we'll move on after that to the city of Pokhara in 2010. Um, and the context for anthropological filmmaking is pretty well summarised by this contrast. This first film shows you the central street of Pokhara, up from Mahendra Pool, and my wife, my previous wife, walking into what was the centre of civilization, the British Council Library, uh, which where we got our posts and was the most sophisticated part of the city. And then you'll see it's a place which had five cars at that time and two hotels, uh, no electricity. And then 2010. Articles, 
So when we had our research assessment exercises in the department and I would say, well, I've made three films or I've made a video disc or I... Oh, well, thank you, Alan, well done. But where are the articles? It counts for nothing. Um, or hardly anything. I mean, my students liked it a bit, but again, in teaching it wasn't. Um, but there was a deeper um, worry in oneself because one knew that films on their own couldn't convey the complexity, the context of how they were taken, what their meaning was. There was you couldn't provide enough guidance. I, I looked at all these Australian films that David Junis and others made where they tried to describe in these complex Australian rituals what was going to happen. And it went a little way towards it, but it was really difficult if you put too much in the subtext or in the advance. It just didn't seem to work. I tried to get over this problem and I thought I'd partly solved it in the 1960, uh, 1980s um, when uh, a new medium was invented which is called video disc. Some of you, most of you won't have ever seen an optical video disc. This is the first academic video disc ever made on the Naga peoples. And on this there are 54,000 photographs, colour photographs and black and white photographs of hand and walking on them. And they're two soundtracks. You put it into a machine, you link it to a computer, we wrote the software, we put this, we, we had a museum exhibition, and we wrote a book. Multimedia, in other words. Um, but within a year, the players had more or less disappeared. Um, no one had the, all the kit together um, <coughs> with the programs and so on. So we were able to give a copy to the Nagas themselves, but then that quickly disappeared. So it didn't work as did the parallel BBC Doomsday Disc, which I was involved with. It just didn't take off as a multimedia platform. So the problem remained unsolved. Um, what uh, has happened in the last three years, I think, three or four years, because everything is speeding up, um, <coughs> is for me, a, I, I think, a, a great liberation, and that is that two things really. One is that there are proper data, visual data archives now available in the world where you can hold your films so that anyone in the world can see them properly. Till that happened, until it, and this university was a pioneer in this field with digital space, D-space, with Cornell and MIT, till you could actually put them up in the cloud, <coughs> big films, then um, that part was impossible. How would people watch them? Of course, you could use YouTube, but YouTube is also very recent, and uh, you can't embed YouTube videos very easily in anything else. At least I haven't found a, a good way of doing it. I have put up hundreds of films on YouTube, but it's, it's still vaguely unsatisfactory. So the arrival of mass media storage archives was one great liberation. The other was something that only happened last year, at least in my life, which was on-demand um, publishing, free publishing. Um, I knew about Lulu, and then when I, for another reason, needed to publish a lot of autobiographical works, I consulted with a friend of mine, and he said, well, have you heard about the new Amazon publishing platform called CreateSpace? And I said no, he didn't even really know about it. And no, no one I talked to, including people like Mark Turing, had heard of it. Anyway, last, about this time last year, I started tinkering with this. Uh, you just type in create space and, and you'll find it. This is a miracle, really. It's, it could be a big threat to publishers. Um, but if used properly, it's, it's very releasing. Basically, you put up your, you have to have a finished PDF or uh, of a text, you have to have something written, and you have to do all the work to get it up in a decent space, but you create your own cover on it, put it up, you price it in the way you want it, they assign you an ISP, um, it goes up in three or four hours all over the world on all the Amazon sites, and you can, with a press of the button, put it into a Kindle book form, and you pay nothing, and they pay you royalties on what you decide is the profit margin. And the books can be published very cheaply. Um, I bought three examples. This, this book is probably about, it's not actually available because I'm uh, working on it at the moment, but it's probably seven or eight pounds. 
um, to buy, and I make the profit of one or two pounds on that. Um, that's a 200 page book with many, many, many photographs in it. Uh, if you want colour, it's more, of course. Um, and there's instant gratification, of course. You can, uh, I've printed this off so I can look at it and edit it, just one copy, um, and then I can make more copies. And the other great advantage, of course, is that you can change it overnight if someone finds a mistake in it, or you find you want to write another chapter, as I do. You can just next day put up the next edition. Now, there is the, the other part of it which I want to show you, and this is the first time I've ever tried this and you'll be the first people to see this, is that you can begin to think of what I, at the moment, roughly term a video book. This is using the idea of electronic books, which many of them are using this sort of technique, but I'm not sure how many anthropologists are. This is the idea that you can produce a hard copy of your book, which people can have there with all the text and all the analysis and all the background and all the context and anything that is academically necessary. And in it, embedded in it, are um, what are in fact portals or links to films. So I will show you um, just uh, hopefully a quick, quick, quick example in a moment. Um, this is this book, Bill Meyer's World, The Life and Death of a Girl Woman, the lady I mentioned who died tragically in 1995. And so here is Bill Meyer in various films that I took off her doing various things. Each of these is a the film, but this isn't clickable. Um, so this is dedica dedicated to her family. And um, so we have um, a description of the book and how I got to know her and um, uh, <clears throat> stuff about the relationship and so on. So it sets the context of the films and then you go down, this is how we got to know each other, um, and you can put as many photographs. <coughs> this is based ultimately on, on the interview. It's divided up in the way that the interview is done. So the personal life, the agricultural life, the social life, the ritual life, all in her own words. The whole interview is transcribed. So it is a, a Gurung woman talking about her life. Um, and then all the films that I made about that life, the context, her doing the things she's talking about in the interviews are available as well. So harvesting maize, uh, describing the farm animals, and then you can watch a film about um, milking a buffalo or whatever, whatever. Um, see her milking the buffalo and so on. But just to show you the thing in action, if this was an electronic book, um, I put in a couple of links to DSpace, uh, to uh, something even better than DSpace called Streaming Media Service. Um, and here is that dance that we saw before, the ritual dance, the gato. And I asked her about it. And she says, um, I, I do not understand the song of the gato dance. Gato means Kermwati, wife of Pasaro. Although I used to be the helper of the gato dancers because I was young, I could not understand or learn the gato song. The work of the helper includes dressing in the gato dancers. And then she, um, the gato dance is like this. I never dance the gato, now I'm dancing, you will have to give me some money, we will eat buffalo together, because there's a payment. Now in theory, if it works, um, you, if you have the electronic version of this, you click on that. And here you have streaming media service. Um, the, the, this is a more recent development after digital space. And the great thing is you upload your um, video to it in any format you like. And then they re-encode it. They give you about six options. So you can, you can watch that film in MPEG-4, high, low, WebM, which seems very good, in high or low, in iPod video, high or low, and in, um, or turn, turn it into sound, which for interviews and so on is fine. 
And this means that, for instance, if you use low iPod video, this should stream to many parts of the world, which MPEG-4 and a higher quality wouldn't. But to return to um, the film, we'll, we'll do it in MPEG-4. And here you can actually see what I translated there, or was translated there. Part of the long interviews. Do you know it or not? What's meaning that? If there is then the film, and here is she's watching the performance of it, and so you can have the actual um, performance.
45 years, and it's a very nice occasion to get invited. Thank you very much.